Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. And uh, today we are going to be talking about climate innovation and retirement. Laura, is that right? Yeah, it is. It's exciting. And, you know, they may sound unrelated, but in fact, they really are. And our guests here are going to tell us a little bit more about that. And uh, who do we have? Friends of ours. Yes, we have friends. Um, they've they've braced the podcast before, and we've had them part of our forums. Uh, most recently, a few months ago, uh, the Retire Tech Forum. Charlie and Stephanie came to Connecticut, both virtually and in person, and they talked a lot about climate and its impact um, and why people should be listening. So, Charlie Sidoti, he's joining us as Executive Director of Insure. And Charlie, I look forward to you um, telling our listeners a bit more about Insure and the work you're doing there. And Stephanie, you know, we've had you on a few times too, and now in your role as Managing Director of Insure, it's exciting to have you both together. Um, and selfishly, it's it's fun when friends work with each other and we can get them back on here. So, Charlie, let's start with you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that Insure does. Oh, thank you very much, Laura and Paul. Thanks for having us back. Thanks for having us at uh, the Retire Tech event and uh, all the support you've given. Um, Insure is a nonprofit. Our mission is to foster innovation in insurance. And we really focus at this intersection of insurance innovation and climate risk. We think climate risk is uh, an area that is going to affect really all of society, but specifically existing insurance products, the need for new insurance products, the need to close the protection gap. And so we're really trying to focus on how innovation uh, can shape the, the insurance market and really catalyze a, a, a decisive response to climate change by the the industry. Yeah, and uh, uh, I guess first question is, tell us a little bit more about the event you just had up in Boston. Uh, Laura was up there. I unfortunately couldn't make it for, for, for conflicts, but just heard it was a really good continuation of some of the discussions you've been having. Yeah, thank you, thank you again. It was we we had a it was a climate forum. It's our uh, first annual uh, climate forum, and it really is focused on this intersection of uh, insurance innovation and climate risk. And what we really tried to do is 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 get is connect people across traditional boundaries. So we had people from the PNC sector, but also uh, you know Laura was there people from retired tech, life, health, and benefits, but also people from uh, nonprofits, uh, from people who really don't know how some of these financial products and insurance products work, but know that they do impact um, things that are important for the transition to a low carbon economy. So there was a lot of uh, connecting. And then there was, we, we got into uh, some really deep topics around, you know, how do you insure carbon credits? How can the insurance industry and financial products industry use the assets on the asset side to support uh, investments into green bonds and and uh, uh, efforts that improve resilience to communities? I think at the end of the day, it all gets back to how does the industry support people along a, a wide spectrum of risks that are changing because of climate change. And everybody kind of understood that, but came from a lot of different perspectives. And there was a lot of great conversation and a lot of great uh, people meeting people outside of the, the normal networks that they kind of often run into at industry conferences. So we, we yeah. think it was great. It, it was a great day. Um, and kind of double click on the connection. And earlier we were talking about creating groups around communities and it's something that we do. Stephanie, I'd love to hear from you. You know, please introduce yourself, talk about the work you're doing at Insure. And I know a lot of that is with partnerships. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be with you. I have started working with Insure just earlier this year. I come from a corporate innovation background in financial services and in insurance. And it's been really exciting to get involved in climate work and work with Charlie. Uh, 
I helped with the development and planning of this climate forum, and we had a really interesting, um, and we've gotten some good feedback on the model for this session. It was, our, as Charlie mentioned, our first annual event. And along with bringing together people from both when, within and outside of insurance, which was a really nice blend, we also had some of uh, the startups in our network and our researchers. Uh, we work with different universities on uh, academic projects going on that we support in an R&D fashion to help with designing new insurance solutions that address climate risk and climate change. So we had some startup pitches throughout uh, this, the event in, interspersed between the panel sessions that we covered. And it was exciting to focus on uh, supporting some of the climate tech, insure tech startups, which I know would be of interest to the reimagined community. So I wanted to bring that up as well. And in, we also had some of our researchers um, from Syracuse, and we had people from Northeastern there, and Georgia, and SUNY ESY share a little bit about the research they have going on in the areas that we're looking at, such as bioeconomy and wildfire risk and EVs, electric vehicles. There was a, it was a really neat um, combination of activities at, at the forum. So, so I, I would say, you know, we, we've had a continuing dialogue around climate. Maybe take us up to speed on your, on your thinking of how climate intersects with um, retirement planning. We think there's a lot of opportunity here, and I think we're going to be hearing more and more about this. So um, we appreciate the partnership and your interest in helping us bring this forward. As you've probably heard or may be hearing soon, both the Department of Labor and the SEC have brought up earlier this year, and this is coming from pressure like, you know, going outside of just financial systems that's coming from the IPCC. Charlie can help me with that acronym, um, that we begin to look at uh, having financial disclosure requirements for climate risk. And even though right now in the U.S. it's starting as just asking for a request for comments from the SEC and the Department of Labor, we expect to see there being some regulatory requirements coming in the future for uh, indicating the climate risk in financial portfolios. So we think that there will be more attention paid to climate from the financial services industry and in insurance specifically, that there's going to be opportunities um, in the retirement space. A couple opportunities that are, I think, really in front of us are one is consumer demand for more ESG products. And we see that potentially moving also into the annuity space where consumers and insurers um, may begin to consider offering ESG options like ESG annuities. Another opportunity to go beyond that is like an asset management side at insurers and looking at their portfolios. There's a lot of underlying risk in those bond portfolios beginning to really peel away at what are those risks, those climate risks in their portfolios and looking at uh, supporting resilience activities in communities and getting more involved in resilience. We see some insurers on the PNC side stepping up there, as well as looking at alternatives like supporting green bonds or blue bonds, uh, which are uh, supporting more environmental initiatives. And then one other option we've talked about before, Paul, which we know is something you've brought up is, is supporting just transition through perhaps some type of an annuity instrument to help people make a transition from working in the fossil fuel industry to working perhaps in green energy or other other uh, areas and help them make a transition over time. Yeah, well, I, th I think since we last talked, oh yeah, we had a big storm come through Florida, Ian. <laughs> uh, oh yes, put an asterisk on it. Uh, I actually found, you know, we were, we were, the four of us were way ahead of the time. And I think, Laura, we gotta, we gotta put this one out. Scientific American, yes, yeah, Scientific American, October 14th, put out an article, Hurricane Ian destroyed retirees' life savings. Many retirees put their savings into real estate in the parts of southwestern Florida that Hurricane Ian severely damaged, okay? Um, 800,000 homes, okay, got hit. Um, 600,000 got flattened. And here's the, uh, this is Scientific American, okay? <laughs> It's uh, so it's got it must be right. 
29% of the population of Lee County, okay, where I made landfall, is of retirement age. In Collier County, that figure rises to 33%. Uh, if there's ever been a stamp on retirement risk equals climate risk, I think, uh, is there a better, I mean, is there a better example? I, I would, I would just highlight what, like what you just walked through is exactly right. And, and, and what I loved about your retire tech event was it, it started out with like, why are you here talking about climate? And then it kind of went to some points like that. And I think this kind of builds over time that people start to realize that like these changes are introducing a whole new set of risks and, and, and people's security isn't from like a PNC side or an annuity side or a life side. It, it is like the, the whole kind of plethora of products and services that are available and, and the hurricane in Florida, absolutely, you know, the things that you described, but, but also, uh, you know, the, the, the protection gap, the protection gap, which is on all sides is, is um, it's exacerbated by the changing kind of just uh, catastrophe kind of risk profile. And then if you layer on people transition, you know, there's a transition to a low carbon economy, which changes people's career paths, which changes their ability to save for retirement. These things are, are, are complex and they cascade on top of each other. So there's definitely a need to kind of rethink, you know, just the risks that we're protecting people from, for sure. So this one may sound a little silly, but follow me on this. Right. So Paul just read some data from an event that did happen and people were impacted in, in many ways, unfortunately. Is that going to be enough uh, for, I, for people to realize that there's a connection? And is that going to be enough? And I use that word lightly in, in quotes for people to take action or at least understand or start to, to think about the potential of climate differently, right? Because I'm sure there's the people who say, yes, this is happening. There's people who say, la, 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 I can't hear you. And then there's people in the middle who say, well, maybe. Uh, I, th I think like, like all the discussions about how you sell to people uh, and meeting people where they are and kind of their, their, their journey and, and how they buy and, and what they buy. I think those concepts all apply to this. And it, it gets down to presenting some very basic facts of like, if sea level rises, what happens to the coast of Florida? And it's not if, it's like, this is the timeline. And you have continual conversations, both with customers, but also with people in the industry who are building products and services. And I, and I think it's like, there's also, what we try to also emphasize is, it's not just building products and services that serve society, it's building products and services that people need and that people will buy and showing them how there's an opportunity here to do something different and to capture some markets that are evolving and that will be growing significantly. So. It, it takes time. You have to kind of continue at it. But we've seen a huge change in mentality just over the the last year. And it's, you know, you see some kind of policy action by the government. You see hurricanes like this. You see just it's in the news constantly. These things kind of tend to build up and we think it's hitting a... Um, you know, maybe I'm too close to it, but I feel like there's definitely been significant movement and there will always be laggards, but uh, you got to focus on the people that, that are kind of moving. I'll add on to that too. Um, what really interests me about your question, Laura, is I come from a background of working on behavior change. And I think what you're trying to get at is how do we get to the point where people try to proactively address this and are, we're not as reactive to natural disasters. Uh, there's a lot more um, movement around this. And I was jokingly telling one of our partners um, 
the other day because we're looking at profiling in the future, perhaps one of the communities in Florida that did really well during the hurricane. Um, and you probably saw it in the news, Babcock Ranch was profiled a few times on 60 Minutes on NPR. You know, they're doing all these things to promote resilience. They've got a solar farm. They built beyond the regulatory requirements to withstand the hurricane. They're right near Fort Myers and we're virtually untouched. So we're trying to showcase stories of resilience in action or behavior change. So who's chosen to live in that community and help um, move pe the move the needle here by showcasing stories um, of people understanding and addressing climate risk proactively uh, to let others know what's possible. I think part of the behavior change issue is people lack of understanding, lack of awareness, and how to take action and what they could do differently. So in the retirement space, what I'm seeing is more advocacy happening, not just on the regulatory side, but individuals asking for changes in their 401k portfolios that companies offer them, you know, wanting to have more options that are green options available to them, not just ESG, but, you know, I am concerned about the environment. What can I do with my retirement savings? And what can you offer me that looks different? So I think that's some of the things we're seeing happening. Yeah, well, if questions are a lot more powerful than the answers. And I've got to do a better job framing this this question. You'll, you'll be my first, ten, uh, <laughs> my focus group here. You know, should we really rewrite the code of retirement risk management to include climate? Now, back to back up, show right before you, okay, <laughs> Uh, we had a really good discussion with Cheryl Connor at Income Conductor. We had a couple other discussions with Dave Macchia and Dave Bonacci at uh, at Luma about dynamic retirement plans. Like, I'm going to go a little deep, and I'll I'll take it back. 15 years ago, you go meet with a planner, interview you, take some stuff down on a piece of paper. I go back in my shop. Two months later, of well, I've got this big thick book. Charlie, here you go. Here's your plan. <laughs> Come back in ten years. Not it's not really, but that was kind of what it is. Now, now today, you know, we got a lot of very sophisticated planning technology that's available at the fingertips of advisors. And by the way, designed perfect for doing remote consulting, where I can have a plan, and you know what? It, guess what? We can see how it dynamically works, you know, over time, and it's, it's very sophisticated. But hmm. Most of these are geared towards tax planning. So you got Florida, New York, high ta tax state. You know, let's, let me, here's my plan. I'm going to work hard, get my pension from New York. <laughs> and then I'm going to retire down to Florida. So when I take the money out of the pension, I'm not, you know, paying taxes on this thing. Voila, I just solved my retirement problem. Well, hmm. How about where I lived? How close is it? What's m probably my house is the biggest r risk. Biggest asset I've got next to Social Security, my balance sheet. Hmm, is this as secure as I think it should be? It, what a I neat would, idea. I would say it is a neat idea, and here's one reason why it's critically important. As you said, your 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 house and your physical assets are one of the biggest assets. There's the potential that they get wiped out by a hurricane, like we saw in Florida. But there's also the potential, and there's a lot of these startups that Stephanie was talking about earlier, they're looking at asset values just based on climate models. You're going to see something that I think has not really happened over time is that, that assets are going to go down based on the, you know, people aren't going to want to buy properties where there's a clear indication and we're getting to that point where like sea level is going to ride and, and affect this property in the future so values are going to just erode absent the catastrophes and that is a very significant thing to understand and people that understand it through the planning process that you talked about will be dramatically better off and and what you're going to see in in most countries the wealth, the, the more affluent communities, they don't live on the coast like they do in the United States. They usually live higher up because of some of these factors that have been historical things. 
Um, and you're going to probably see a transition in where people live. And uh, it's going to be driven by property valuations, which are a key part of the planet. And the ability to get insurance. I mean, we have 40% of our people, at least in the U.S., I think, are on coasts. And they're subject to now either flooding or wildfire risk or earthquakes or <laughs> hurricane, you know, weather and uh, weather events. And in certain cases, as you might know, in California, you can't get insurance because of wildfire risk. And, you know, it may not be feasible to remain in those areas and your property values are already being impacted. Um, so we will we will see changes based on not only the financial planning piece, which I think adding a module here on climate risk is a really neat and fascinating idea. It's also if you can't get insurance, you might be more limited. Uh, I think people have learned in Florida, you know, flood insurance came in handy uh, and they it was more of um, a carrot versus a stick. You know, people had it because they had to. And it's very, it's just not affordable. So it's really going to also impact where people choose to live. In my mind right now, I have a GIS mapping, right? So the map overlays, kind of like the FEMA flood maps. So when we were building our house, we are near water, a few bodies of water, not on a coast. And it was interesting to see how far and where on the property we could build based on these maps that were severely outdated. And I understand that FEMA is still working on updating those, and that's a wonderful thing. But how interesting would it be? And it could very well be out there. I haven't researched it myself, where you have kind of a, you know, if say if I'm a realtor, right? And we, in, in many of these episodes, we talk about how can you just embed insurance into things. Say I'm a realtor and I have my app on my phone, and Stephanie, you're looking to buy a house. And I say, all right, let me pull up my app. Where are you looking in this region? And I click on some overlays that show, all right, Stephanie wants to be in this proximity of this water. She wants to do, you know, certain certain pieces that Stephanie wants for her home. Wouldn't it be interesting to have all the information kind of overlaid on top of one another to show potential long-term impacts? So not only is it, oh, well, you're in a FEMA flood zone, you're going to need this insurance, or I'm sorry, you can't get that insurance because of wildfire, wouldn't it be interesting to do some other overlays on there um, to show a full picture all at once instead of looking at it segmented, kind of like what we're talking about today? It, it, there's a lot of work going on to do exactly that. There, if you look at the kind of arcane and and um, very technical kind of catastrophe modeling that is done on the PNC side, there is a movement by uh, organizations like First Street to say, how do you present that information in clear, transparent, and understandable ways to consumers? And like one of the things is instead of saying you're in the 100-year floodplain or the 500-year floodplain, putting it in dollar terms, say that your average annual cost for catastrophes is X. And it can be a few hundred dollars or it could be tens of thousands of dollars, which that resonates with people the way you're talking. And then in, and they're talking literally about embedding it on Zillow, like you're talking about. In, exactly. In, at, at points where people are making decisions that they don't even think about these climate costs. But if it's presented in dollar terms to at that, at that point and also say your insurance cost is going to be this, it just... It, it it enables them to make better decisions, which and, is, I think, what needs to happen because a lot of it, it could, is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was sorry to cut you off, but it's like I just got another idea. Wouldn't it also be interesting? I love it to have in that same kind of mapping the percentage of or your odds of you being in a good location for uh, solar. Should you want to go off the grid or use, you know, or wind or other types of energy usage, and just get it all together. We we could not agree more. We think we talk a lot about when we get into our projects is what is the total cost of risk over a long term time horizon? Like a lot of people buy annual policies on the, the PNC side, but the risk is over 10, 20 years like life insurance. And so you need to understand what are the aggregate of all the risks across the entire time horizon to make the right decisions. And and we, 
as an industry, and, and clearly, I think the financial planning is where it all comes together. Is like that's the point where you, we can explain the like this is your risk, this is your cost of risk, including the things that you can do to mitigate it, like solar panels or raise your house or install whatever protection. Like looking at all the costs, not just the pieces of the cost over small periods of time. Okay, well, and I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to th- throw a little spin to this, which is what is new is sometimes old. Have you heard of, uh, do you know of, of tsunami stones? Have you heard of these? No, okay. I cannot wait. I love stuff like this. Okay, as far back, okay, there are these stones around Japan, and they're called tsunami stones. They've been there in place. Some of these go back 600 years. And literally, like some of the translations, and I'm sure this is probably, you know, butchered. You know, it's like bad tattoo or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the translation I have for one of those stones is it says, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the cl- calamity of great tsunamis. Do not build any homes below this point. You know, I think, oh, Laura, what you're asking for is I we need some, some tsunami new tsunami stones. stones here. Maybe that's what we need. What do you think? Uh, I what, love it. Stephanie, Stephanie, I mean, <laughs> wind is high. What I like about it, Paul, is obviously you're thinking differently and you're thinking creatively because whatever we're doing right now, you know, we need we need creative solutions to these challenges we're discussing. I, I've actually to spin off that a little bit i like the simplicity and i i like the symbolism of a stone um i've been actually personally looking at a lot of art because that gives me inspiration for working in innovation and i think there's a lot of other outlets we could be using to help people here and get get the messages across it seems so simplistic but i really think it's it's a great idea to stick i think that helps people and and simple enough to include in planning, you know, like look it up. I think the risk modeling is really complex, but these are simple messages you can start to have a conversation in, in the financial planning conversations. Yeah. Well, and in terms of like making this stuff real for people, you know, Laura, you know, I had this real interesting discussion with a a, a company that's doing AR in the Hartford area, trying to think about like, what, what could we do here um, to, um, cheaply but effectively convey messages yeah could you do some virtual you know ar uh what if you had pokemon go for climate change right (laughs) you know here's the level the water is going to be at this particular point in 2030. i recommended the other day to the partner i mentioned we're doing some behavior change work together that and i was being facetious but it rolls off what you said what if we had a version of a theme park where you actually ex- viscerally experience all of these things? So you're viscerally experiencing the wind force of a hurricane. You're viscerally experiencing the water level. I mean, that may, it's not, I know it's, it's pathetic, but it's kind of like if you viscerally experience this, it's very different than hearing about it. And one of the things we're trying to do that Stephanie's been working on is is to say, like, the root cause is the greenhouse gas and the, how do you get to a low-carbon economy. People don't even know what the heck I'm saying sometimes when I say we need to transition to a low-carbon economy. But what does that mean for me? Like, how does that change the economy? Who's going to be doing more or what? We're We're working on a simulation where people... And there's not one path to a low carbon economy. There's lots of different paths. So people can do sliders and it's a pretty cool simulation tool to to say, like, what what's the path that I think is the best way to get there? Which at the end of the day educates hopefully industry professionals building products and services in all the sectors, a better understanding of how the economy could change and then start thinking about like, how does this transition to a low carbon economy present opportunities to me as a product person in in the annuity space and the life health benefits space and wherever. Um, so we think that's an important thing to kind of start thinking about these things as, as, cause there are a lot of policy issues here, public policy. It's easy to say, well, that's a public policy issue, but 
our our real mission is how do we how do we incorporate what's going on in policy in the real physical world with climate change into better products and services that help people deal with the risk yeah the simulation we're doing that um, Charlie mentioned, I know you want to ask us about upcoming events. Um, it's a, in partnership with an organization called Climate Interactive, and um, they've got a simulator exercise we're going to do with our membership in December and in January, where you get, like you said, some hands-on practice with making trade-offs about how we can re keep global warming to 1.5 degrees, uh, and you look at policy, you look at like the carbon markets and cap and trade ideas, you look at a variety of different ways to get there and make these trade-offs in the simulation and then discuss that. And it's a great education tool, as Charlie said. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I have this um, vision in my mind. Have, have any of you ever heard of witch sticks or using okay. a witch stick to find water underground? So yes, exactly. And I feel I feel like I can see Charlie and Stephanie in a field with the witch sticks trying to locate and point and identify all of these pieces to start bringing them together. Because I feel like some of this is out here, but it's, it's bringing it all in. And something I, I don't think we touched on today because it's a little bit outside of the work um, that you all are focused on, but more so as consumers and as humans who are wanting to make these changes and whether it's, you know, green options for retirement, I'll put in our show notes. Um, I have a friend who's actually full time focused on content creation for how to live a better, greener, um, of the earth life. And it's fascinating. So you talk about the carbon emissions and every time she travels on a plane or something that emits a lot of pollution, what she does to help offset that in her own life. So I just find that piece of it interesting as we talk about these larger issues that will take time and regulation and industry to get around. There's things that we all could do on a daily. So that's just a fun little thing that I'll throw into the show notes that y'all can see. But, um, but I guess Stephanie, to, to echo your, your point on the upcoming events, you had also talked about upcoming workshops. And for our listeners who really want to learn more about what you and Charlie are doing and the team at Ensure, you know, what else is on the horizon? What should we know about? And how do we learn more about this? Well, I want to just thank you again for your support as our partners, because I know this community will be interested. And thank you for letting us get the word out. The climate sim simulation one is the one I'm working on. And those workshop dates are December 8th and January 10th. And our, we'll put out more information about how to sign up. I encourage people to join Insure's membership community, and then you'll get information regularly on our events and I know you can share more on that in the in the notes to follow. I'll pass it to Charlie for some other upcoming events that we have planned. Yeah, and, and one of the events is related to how can you uh, create baskets of products and services for a community? The, the industry talks a lot about the protection gap at a global level, but where it impacts is at a local level. And we know there's a lot of kind of research that says, you know, a dollar invested up front in in insurance is you know i don't know what the number is but it's like 10 or 20x more expensive if you're trying to address these as disaster relief so there's a, a legitimate case to be made for communities to invest in closing the protection gap through public partner private uh, partnerships so we're we're working on some kind of lightweight workshops and also some deeper kind of engagements to create some new products around that Similarly, we're, we're focusing on um, th this part of that is actually how to group concepts that work well in kind of the life, health and benefit space cut across a, 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 a basket of uh, solutions, including property casualty. We love the idea of bringing kind of all the different subsectors of the industry together that almost never kind of develop products together because People don't think of it as I need some P and C products or annuity products or, you know, uh, property casualty products. They think of it more like I need to be, I need to manage my risk. So how can these things come together? Um, we're also doing wildfire, some general education, like the, the, the things that Stephanie was talking about. 
Um, we're looking at, uh, you all know Stacy Brown, we're looking at potentially doing some climate events at his symposium in May in Shurtak Hartford. Um, so there's a lot going on. If people are interested in any way about insurance uh, innovation and climate, we would love to have separate conversations as well. Thanks. Yeah, and we, we in, would enjoy the opportunity to get to know more of the startups that might be at that intersection of climate tech and insure tech and clean tech. So we can bring them into the ecosystem and your networks um, and, you know, accelerators and, and venture capital. We want to do an investor event similar to something you've done in the past in my prior role we did together. And um, we'd love to do something like that in the future. Excellent. Right, well, uh, look, count us in. Uh, we'll put links to your organization events in our, our show notes. But, you know, hey, th thanks for coming back and look look forward to your uh, to coming to and participating in your event in December and, uh, you know, future future endeavors. So thanks for joining us, Laura. Thanks. And uh, uh, thanks for listening. And uh, join us again next week for another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Thanks.